In this episode, we are going to discuss the secret door and so much more, including the police investigation into Moscow, Idaho, Brian Koberger. We're going to have some clarification on cryptocurrency, cults, panties, and so much more. So, without further ado, let's see what I have to say for myself this time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Crime Circus. My name is Drip Drop, and I'll be your host as always. In this episode, we're going to have a discussion about the Idaho 4 and so much more. We're going to talk about a few different things, and we're going to lead right into the secret door. Yeah. First, let's have some clarifications on my previous video. In my previous video, we talked about cowboys and cryptocurrencies. I asked all of you, what do you think that cowboy had in his hand? He was concealing something, we just didn't know what it is. <laughs> I picked the top three guesses that I saw that really made sense to me. Number one, one of you out there thought he was concealing the black diamond. The black diamond from the hex cryptocurrency scam. Hmm. Someone else out there thought that they were retrieving a cryptocurrency flash drive. And this is what a cryptocurrency flash drive looks like. That is a possibility because those men seemed like they were on a mission to retrieve something very important. The black diamond or a cryptocurrency flash drive. And for those of you that don't know, a cryptocurrency flash drive can be very valuable. Millions and millions of dollars on a little USB drive. Yeah. Also, one of you out there guessed that it was Kaylee's panties. Now that's really specific. I don't know how you know for sure it was hers and not one of the other girls, and there was quite a few other girls in the home that evening. But this is no laughing matter because one of Canada's most famous serial killers is this man. And he had an infatuation and an obsession with taking victims' panties. That was his thing. He would go into homes and snatch away. Yeah. Really disturbing, but that is what he did. I personally really hope the cowboy wasn't taking panties. Moving right along. They weren't wearing body cams. They weren't escorted to the Moscow PD crime scene by Moscow PD. These are unidentified individuals, and law enforcement has to wear identification, including badges and name cards. Yeah. You can't just cruise up to a crime scene in a minivan, have your way with it, and cruise off without identifying who you are. You have to remember, they serve us, they work for us. Yeah. Which means they answer to us. And if those guys don't, that's us. Also, you gotta remember this is a death penalty case, and we need to know who they were and what they were doing there. It's important. Keep in mind, this was only two days after the warrant was served on DoorSlash. Coincidence? I think not. And why wasn't the lead detective in this homicide investigation with them accompanying them? Is anybody just allowed to roll into that house? Extract an item or two? And roll out? Apparently. Because I've seen no mention of them in the court paperwork by the prosecution or the defense. Maybe Ann Taylor doesn't even know about the Cowboys. We don't know because nobody will tell us anything. All we can go off is our own intuition, the tarot cards, the psychics, the numerologists and astronomers. I see you out there and I'm right here. I appreciate everyone's good advice, wisdom, tips and tricks in this case. Every single one of you out there has helped me greatly. So thank you. Every single individual investigating this case helps in their own little way. Each person discovers their own little clue. At this point, we're all heavily invested into the Moscow-Idaho investigation. At this point, we need justice for the victims. At this point, we need to know what happened, how it happened, and who did it. That's important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess without the body cams, we can't even do a public records request and get the body camera footage. So even the lead homicide detective doesn't have a clue what those guys did in the crime scene and no suspects had been named and nobody had been arrested yet. I don't know if it's just me, but that's sus to us. Moving right along. 
Somebody out there slid into my Patreon inbox, very concerned about my well-being. They told me that I needed to get holy water ASAP. So that's exactly what I did. I have obtained holy water right here. So I've got my holy water right here, and it really is delicious. And as you can see, I've taken this cross off my neck because one of you out there warned me that a cult member could just yank this thing off my neck and stick it into my eyeball. And that really wasn't a good vision to have. Plus, I don't want to lose my vision, so it's safer off of my neck, and I'm safer with it off of my neck as well. Anyways, I recommend every single one of you out there have holy water in your possession at all times. And you can never have too much holy water, right? So, let's discuss the cult. I'm going to play you a short video that was uploaded to YouTube on October 13th, 2022. That's exactly one month prior to this crime. The crime happened on November 13th. This video was uploaded on October 13th. And on October 13th, coincidentally enough, that is the release date of Halloween Ends. The horror movie with Michael Myers, the whole slasher flick. Yeah, and there is a lot of occult symbolism in that movie. I'm actually afraid to watch that movie again because there is so much numerology and creepy stuff and some of it links potentially to this crime. Yeah. Anyways, let's watch this video and then we're going to have a discussion about this video. There's a new threat in this great land and it's come to Ida. It can take on many forms and names, but we know it as the cult. With feverish hate, they work to destroy our sacred values beliefs, and what is most precious to us. There's only one way to fight this evil. Find them, and chase them out. For now, they failed. But they're still lurking in the darkness. And this battle has just begun. That video that we just watched was created by a man named Ammon Bundy. He's a patriot and a freedom fighter, and he's been living in Idaho for many years. And that was his campaign commercial running for governor. Yeah, have you ever seen any political commercials that look like that? This man is dead serious, and he's not playing around. There really is a cult, and he really wants to defeat them. He really, really does. In fact, this cult has attempted multiple times to put him in prison for the rest of his life for victimless crimes. But that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. That video was recorded in Idaho. This man was running for governor in Idaho. Apparently there's a cult in Idaho. Yeah, leave your comments and thoughts down below. And that takes us right back to Delphi, Indiana with Richard Allen, Abby and Libby. We're getting straight to breaking news tonight. New accusations in the Delphi murder case. Attorneys for the defendant, Richard Allen, say they have new evidence that law enforcement lied and tried to hide information. Richard Allen's lawyers are not playing around. They have filed more paperwork. They're doubling down on their claims of this cult. And they have uncovered more police lies. Why, oh why, do the officials keep lying to us? It's us. The police in Delphi, Indiana said that a professor from Purdue said that it wasn't an occult ritual. But a new interview popped up the day after the defense filed court paperwork, and suddenly there he was. And surprise, oh surprise, he said it was possibly an occult ritual. And another professor from Harvard co-signed. So that's two people that spend every day of their lives, it's their careers researching this stuff. It's what they do. They're specialists. It's what they are. They know a lot more about it than you or me or anybody else. And according to their own research, the cult passed away Abby and Libby. That's why the bodies were posed and little antlers were put above Abby's head. And that's why Libby was stripped. And the crime scene was really graphic. I've read some disturbing things in this case and I've even seen some disturbing images. So don't go looking for anything because you might regret what you find. Anyways, do you think these two cases are connected? Maybe, maybe not. All we know for sure is that Richard Allen is for sure innocent. 
Is Brian Koberger innocent? We don't know, but we haven't seen any evidence that makes us believe he is. All we've seen is tabloid information in the genealogy DNA tree where they won't show their work, and showing your work is always important. Anyways, that brings us back to the Moscow, Idaho police investigation. Let's check out this footage and see what we think about it. Here you can see two police officers randomly walking across this field. It appears they're looking down at the ground. Maybe they're looking for evidence. I don't know about your thoughts, but my feelings, that's not a very big search team. Now look at these two guys here. What do you think they're doing with that jacket? They seem to have a real interest in the jacket laying by the fire hydrant. In fact, that looks exactly like Maddie's jacket from the grub truck video. Let's have a side-by-side -side comparison. Comment down below. Am I right or am I right? That looks like Maddie's jacket. Did any of you observant folks also see what I saw in that video? Let's roll it back one more time and zoom in. We can see a soda can here, possibly a Red Bull can. Don't you think that could be an important piece of evidence in this case? I've seen homicide cases solved by a single cigarette butt. So maybe the perpetrator's DNA could have been on that soda can. Maybe, maybe not, but we'll never know because that soda can wasn't collected and neither was the jacket. It was just left on the side of the road like it wasn't important. That's concerning and that's super alarming. How do we feel about this investigation? How could evidence just be left on the side of the road? We need to know. We really do. This is a death penalty case. Four innocent, beautiful lives were taken away from this earth forever. So we really do need to know. We need to know where that jacket is, who has it, and what happened to that soda can. Somebody's DNA was on that can. Mm-hmm. Before we move along, I'm gonna have a little more holy water. Go get you some, ladies and gentlemen. It's really good. Now let's have a brief discussion about cell phone towers, cell phone pings, and how they work. Because as far as we know, that's one of the only pieces of evidence where they're attempting to link Brian Koberger to this crime scene. Cell phone pings. I'd like to clear up some confusion for some of you out there. Brian Koberger's phone was not linked to 1122 King Road. That's not what the arrest affidavit says. That's not what any officials have ever claimed. His cell phone simply pinged off a tower. Let's have a look-see at these images right here. The way a cell phone tower works, it can actually broadcast a signal up to 45 miles away. And many towers overlap. And if one cell phone tower is overloaded, your cell phone will connect to a different tower even if you're not in that area. To keep it really simple for you, Brian Koberger's phone could be in his apartment and ping in Moscow, Idaho. Yeah. They never said his phone went to the house. They only said it pinged off a Moscow, Idaho tower. And that doesn't even mean he was in Moscow, Idaho. In fact, even in the arrest affidavit, the police themselves say they don't believe one of the pings is accurate. Hmm. That's sus to us. Yeah. You can't just say one of the pings doesn't count and the other pings all do. Also, don't you think it's a little suspicious that they released the body camera footage of Brian Koberger from August? But not from October. Why not? What do they have to hide? I really do wonder. And so do you, which is why you're watching this program right now, because we're both wondering. We're all wondering. What in the world was going on in this investigation behind the scenes? How did they even come across Brian Koberger? And don't even tell me you randomly matched up his daddy's DNA from a garbage can. I don't believe it. I really don't. According to what I've read and been told, the Idaho State Crime Lab could not build a profile off the smidget of DNA that was left on the sheath. There just wasn't enough. Then it was shipped off to Texas somehow. And then somehow it ended up in the FBI's hands. And the chain of custody is really odd. And apparently they didn't even take any notes. 
or document their investigation properly. We're just supposed to believe them. That doesn't sit well with me. I can't just believe them. I need to see the work. I need to see how they got to their conclusion. Because as far as I'm concerned, they arrested a PhD college student in Pennsylvania, and everything's a secret. In the arrest affidavit for Brian Koberger, they made mention of a single bloody Vans shoe print. In the search warrant, they didn't find any Vans in Brian's house. They found New Balance, and they took those New Balance shoes. Hmm. Also, many of you have become aware that a search warrant was put on YouTube. The creator in this case has been investigated. A warrant has been served. Information has been transferred. Which YouTuber do you think they've been investigating in this case? Sad to say, I think it's me. Because last November and December, I made some Moscow Idaho's that had some explosive booms. And I put them on private. And after I put them on private, they were still getting a few views. And I've never seen that before in all my years of being a YouTuber. The private videos were getting views. And they weren't unlisted. They were private. Which means nobody should have been able to see them. But the view counts went up very slightly. And in the YouTube Creator Studio, you can see where the views come from. However, for these views, there was no location. Take that for what you will. Moving right along. In closing, let's talk about the secret door. Check out these images. We have two possibilities to the entrance into this secret underground tunnel. One of these doors may lead to the tunnel. Nobody has ever seen inside of either of these doors. There's no photographic evidence on all of the internet of what's behind either of these doors. Right here in the hallway, we have a door that is in between the downstairs bathroom and Bethany's room. That door right there would lead over here to underneath that suspicious mound behind the house. That would be a really good location for an underground basement, and it would lead to right underneath the kitchen. That hill right there. The other possibility is this little door. And you know, Brian Koberger is the tall man, so he is too tall to be crawling through that little door. Yeah. But I've seen little doors like that in movies, and they oftentimes lead to little secret underground passageways. It's true, you've probably seen some of those movies. And as you know, many Hollywood movies are based on real life. And for those of you that have seen Lifetime movies, you would know those are very accurate. Very, very, very accurate. And you really do have to be careful which unknown doorways you walk through because you don't know what's waiting for you on the other side. Now let's have a quick look at the crime house from this alternative angle. That's 1122 King Road back here. Up front, right here, this is 1112 King Road. And this is where they got the camera footage of the white Elantra and the DoorDash driver, suspect vehicle number one. But let me direct your attention to the neighbor's house right over here. You can see a little air vent underneath the house. Why would you need an air vent underneath the house? That probably leads to an underground passageway. Yeah. Now, underneath this house right here, this is undeniable. Look at this window. The window literally goes down into the ground, which means whatever that window leads to goes underneath the road. So there's a room underneath the road, right here. We got a window here, we got air vents over there, we got a suspicious mound behind 1122 King Road. We have the mysterious hallway door, and then we have the little door. And don't even tell me that none of these doors lead anywhere. You don't know. They might. And in a proper thorough investigation, we must open all doors. Yeah. We're not going to leave any stones unturned. Not here. Not at Crime Circus. Not at the Crime Circus cult. You're not, and I'm not either. Anyways, I will be back again very soon. There's more I've uncovered behind the scenes regarding this investigation. You might even say it's been a botched investigation for the officials. Yeah, I just keep uncovering things. And in the next episode, we might actually have to discuss Jack Decor. Oh my god. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this presentation. Please remember to smash the thumbs up. Comment down below if you want to. Make sure you're subscribed to both my YouTube channels. Shout out, shout out to all my members and Patreons. I appreciate you so much. 
If you're not a member of Patreon, please consider supporting this channel. It really helps me with these investigations and obtaining interrogation videos. And with the more support I get, I'm considering visiting some of these crime scenes to do a deeper dive investigation, one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on, eyes-on, maybe collect some evidence and do some processing. We'll see. Anyways, until next time, remember to stay safe out there because you know it's a dangerous world.